Hello, this is Anne de Guise. This is my clinical insight on March the 5th, 2021. Uh, if you haven't seen my first video, take a look. There's a lot of great news on the case dropping in the US, but a slowdown and even a plateau and in Europe, maybe a little bit of a bounce. So uh, uh, something we need to keep an eye on. We don't want a fourth, a fourth uh, wave. Uh, in this one, I'm going to talk about the JNG approval, the mutation, what it means, and also a lot of new information on post-COVID. So just a reminder that if you look at people who are, who are infectious, that they means they can give you the, the disease. The majority of people who can give you the disease, the disease are pre-symptomatic. They are infectious, they don't know it, they have no symptoms. And there is, this is that period from the time of exposure uh, to the time they have symptoms there, that, that first two to four days there that they can give it to you. You are a large percent of the population, 40% of the chance you get sick is from somebody who is symptomatic, but may have mild symptoms there. And then you could get it from the environmental, which is surface and all of that, but everybody you know, is, is realizing this is kind of a lower probability there. So, um, and so, so that's kind of a reminder there. So you still have to protect yourself, even if you're vaccinated, you know, be aware of masking, ventilation and distancing. And if you're interested in learning more, we spent quite a bit of time on this on, fe on our February 19 video, please go back on YouTube and take a look at that. Just a reminder, the CDC is now recommending double masking uh, and, and, you know, be careful of, of the, a lot of the K95 that you can buy uh, are counterfeit and may not be uh, very accurate. And recommending three-ply surgical mask and do the knock and tuck. If you don't know what I'm talking about, take a look at my video of two weeks ago. So uh, this is a fun fact, you know, if you want to impress people in one of those Zoom parties that you're having, is that if you take all the COVID particles in the world, you could fit them in one Coca-Cola can. And I'm not picking Coca-Cola, I could be any type of soda can. And if this is an article that was published in, in, the, in, the, in the BBC. And if you do the mask based on the size, which is so tiny there, and you pack them all together there, you find out uh, it basically is, 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 is filling up 78% of that can. This is this thing that's destroying the world. It's so tiny and it's floating around. I mean, it's kind of mind boggling there that we could basically pack all this goddamn virus that's alive, uh, you know, uh, on a daily basis there into one can of, of soda. I thought that was kind of fun. Uh, let's take some good news. Fluvoxamine is an antidepressant that's 40 years old, so a good safety profile there. And the data has just come out. In fact, it's going to be on 60 minutes this Sunday uh, um, on March the 7th there. One of my uh, fellow alumni from Harvard Business School, Dr. David Seftel, uh, is working with the Golden Gate Fields, which is a horse race track here in the Bay Area. And one of the things they did is that they gave fluvoxamine for people who had been diagnosed with COVID. And none of them end up being hospitalized. And remember, we desperately need some type of therapy for people on an outpatient basis. Most of the therapy we have is for people who are hospitalized. And then none of them got hospitalized as opposed to people who didn't take the, the, the drugs. And then they end up with 12% of them, which is the average that end up uh, going into the hospital there. And that ties to a paper that was published in JAMA by Dr. Eric Lenz, again, doing a small study, 152 patients there, showing that 0% of the patient that took that, that, that medication there after having symptoms end up in the hospital versus 8% in the placebo control group. So the NIH now is considering doing a trial of a thousand patients there. So if, if you look at 60 minutes, it should be on this, this Sunday there. So let's talk mutation. And there's an alphabet soup of numbers. So let me see if I can make some sense out of it. The virus by its nature, because it is uh, mutating, it's an unstable virus just by the nature of how, how it's being built, will continue to mutate. And right now we have a race between uh, vaccinating enough people in the population to slow down the chance of this, of this virus mutating and, and basically evading is what we call it, uh, the vaccine and the antibodies. And this virus is not mutating one little thing at a time. At time it can do 20 mutation at one time. And, and, and it's basically the mutation gonna hear about is the N501Y, which is the other way we call it the UK mutation. And that's a way for the virus to basically attach for the ACE2 receptors, which is this piece is here in that spike protein that attached to the ACE2 receptor much more efficiently. 
uh, much more effectively. Therefore, it takes less viral load to basically uh, be infected there. And then we have the South African version that you're going to hear about called uh, E484. And that's the one that is a sneaky one because it, it, it is a little bit different than the prior virus. So the antibody that people have developed as survivors there are no longer as effective at controlling it. And that's the big worry we're having is that people are getting reinfected. And so let's look at the South African version. This is a, a fancy picture of it on a, on a fancy um, um, uh, equipment there. And it, it showed up for the first time on December the 18th. And it showed that mutation 501 that I mentioned earlier there. And it basically has a 10 times reduction of the neutralized antibodies. And neutralized antibodies are first line of defense of basically controlling the spike protein when we get infected there. We also know that it's, it's basically blocking the effectiveness of the plasma therapy. So if you are infected with that South African version, you don't want to get this plasma therapy because one, it doesn't work. Number two, it has some other issues with that. So I think it's getting more and more important we do more genomics uh, of the disease you have in the US as one weakness compared to the rest of the world is that we don't do enough uh, genomic analysis of people when they are sick. And, and, and so we know that the vaccine efficacy is lower for that version. A Pfizer and Moderna vaccine uh, could be as low as 50% less effective. That's a big deal. Um, Novavax shot appears to be in, you know, around 60% effective, and J and J showed they were only 52 to 57% effective. So that B135 or that mutation there called 501 is the one that we want to avoid to propagate around the world. The other one you may have heard about is the UK version called the B117. And the reason why this thing is more contagious there by up to 30 to 70%, depending on the data, is because if you look at the typical infection rate, you have that big peak, and then pretty much at 10 to 14 days, it's over. You know, you're no longer infectious. What's happening with this BB17, you can see it's a longer spread over a longer period of time, up, up to like 20 days. And so therefore, you get this, this higher probability of infecting other people there. So uh, the good news is that the vaccine that we know, which is Moderna, Pfizer, Novavax, j and and AstraZeneca, are working for that UK version. And you're going to see that's important there uh, because that's, that's the one we see in the US the most. But the big thing I want you to understand is that that, vac that infection lasts 13 days on the average, as opposed to the traditional virus is only lasting around eight days when you're infectious. Uh, the variants there, you can see the biggest one is the BB17. These are 2,700 reported cases. And these are the cases where we did the genomics. So in reality, that number is significantly higher. Uh, the B135, which is a South African, you know, you can see is starting to spread in the P1 from Brazil, which we don't want either. You know, uh, there is some incidents there. So we need to keep an eye. That's the big danger of having a, another upswing in March. That's why you still, if you have been vaccinated, please wear a mask because we, we, want, to, we want to stop the propagation of this and you still may be at some risk uh, of some of these variants. So uh, in addition to all of this, just to make life fun, there is another mutation gear uh, called 427 to 429. And that's the one that unfortunately is in California. And it, UCSF did analysis showing that pretty much half of the new cases in California have that mutation. And the problem with that mutation is that you have an 11 times higher chance of uh, ending, ending up dying or being in the ICU. And, and, and what we have again is that 452 mutation there uh, which infect tissue, especially the lung tissue, 40% faster or easier. It's also more transmissible uh, by 19 to 24%. So uh, we need to keep an eye on that because what they did an analysis in the nose is that people who have that mutation, they have two times the viral load, which means they're much more infectious to basically pass on that mutation there. So we don't have enough data yet as far as the effectiveness of the vaccine. It is expected that it could decrease antibody effectiveness by 50%, uh, just because it has some similarity with the South African version there. So keep an eye on that. We're not out of the woods. I really want to reemphasize that this, this, this virus will continue to mutate and we have a race to vaccinate enough people to stop the propagation so we decrease the chance of the, of the virus mutating. 
So uh, the other good news, and the good news is that we're talking right now of the uh, the, uh, the B cells, and the B cells is what's easy to measure there. This neutralizing B cells is what we're really looking for in both the survivors as well as people having the vaccination. Now, we believe, but it's much harder to prove that the T cells is also being built by the vaccine and people have had the disease. And the T cells is not as much of a, as a missile like the, the memory B cells are. It's more of a generic defense system there, but it could still provide a good protection. But it's much harder to, to measure uh, the effectiveness there. So uh, keep an eye on that in the coming months. U.S. vaccination, uh, as we discussed in the first video, it's around 110 million people have had a vaccine. Uh, if you look at the population of people over the age of 18 years old, 21% has at least received one dose. That's fantastic. And that's why you see the massive drop in the infection rate split between Pfizer and Moderna. So I want to give an update on what happened to me. If you remember, I had a huge uh, uh, Moderna COVID arm, which is this really nasty red rashes there that I had for two weeks. I had my second shot and I loaded myself um, with antihistamines, like I talked in my video, and it worked. I highly recommend it. And I check with some infection control and they say it should not affect your immune system response. So uh, the cocktail that I took was uh, Zyrtec at night uh, or Allegra during the daytime, you know, depending which type of medication you like to do there. Uh, and that's really the one that controlled it. I could feel the thing trying to come out after two days. It could typically has the two day delays before it comes out. But uh, basically the antihistamine were able to block it. So I felt it for a couple of days and it went away, but I never had a nasty rash like I had last time. Uh, so please, uh, you know, if you think you may have a reaction there, you have some sensitivity to mosquito bites, you know, please use that uh, the day before your vaccination and then for a few days afterwards, depending, depending how you respond. So good news, j, &J uh, got approved in the U.S. for single dose vaccine. They got the uh, EUA on the 28th of February for people over the age of 18 years old. Uh, McKesson is already shipping 4 million doses this week. There's an additional 20 million doses expected by the end of March and 100 million doses by the end of June. And these are great news because that will help us accelerate, especially with a younger population, because it's a single dose shot. It doesn't require any fancy um, uh, um, refrigerators. So uh, now I want to explain it's a different type of technology. What they use is an adenovirus, which is a cold virus that they modify and they add to it the spike protein, the famous spike protein, which is what attached to your ACE2 receptors there. As a result of that, when that cell goes into your body, your body basically get that cell and they start making that spike protein and the immune system responds by making antibodies there. The efficacy is, can be confusing there. So let me see if I can break it down. Overall, it's 66%. But you cannot really compare this against Pfizer and Moderna there because they were very different circumstances. In their case, they had three pockets, the US, the UK, and South Africa, where they did the testing. Because South Africa had that new mutation we've talked about, their effectiveness was only 57%. Latin America has the Brazil mutation there that we talked about. So the effectiveness was only 66%. In the US was around 72%, which means the overall. But that's just for everything, mild you know, and medium type of cases. The most important part is that it's 100% effective in making sure you don't have a severe case and mortality case. So they had a big impact in severity there. Now, there's a bit something to keep an eye on that, which is the data when you dig down into it shows that it's not as protective for people over the age of 60 years old that have medical condition like hypertension, which is the, the number one uh, prediction of, 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 of mortality. So um, uh, the other good news that has shown on, on a small part of their of the population in the trial is that they think they can decrease by 65%. Uh, the infection rate uh, for people who had the vaccine were infected, but didn't really spread it as much. So uh, side effect is like the other one, headache, fatigue, muscle ache, and injection site. In my case, was a Moderna. I got a hundred degree fever, massive headaches, the whole shebang. I was kind of gone for a couple of days. So just, if you can get, get, get your shot on a Friday. So just a reminder there that the technology is different. So what they're using, they're using uh, the, the, uh, a ribosome there that they basically inject and then the body gets fooled in, mating, in uh, thinking there's a spike protein and then it builds the antigen. This is this famous B cells we've been looking for. But we also know it's building the T cells, which, which may, may be much more lo longer lasting. The B cells may only last six to nine months, maybe 12 months, but the T cells could last maybe years. So keep an eye on that. 
So j and is doing partnerships. Uh, it turns out it's a complicated process. It takes them two months to, to basically uh, create uh, those initial cells in, in fermentation vats. And that's, that's harder to scale up where Pfizer's and Moderna don't do that. So they have plants in Baltimore, India, and the Netherlands to have these big vats to basically make this. And then they have the second big step, which is a major bottleneck right now, is to take these liquids and put them into final formulation and packaging in the vials. And these are these big assembly lines to basically manufacture that. So right now, the big bottlenecks is to be able to do that. And as a result of that, the US made a deal with Merck, which used to be the arch enemy of j and And Merck had stopped the efforts with their vaccine to convert two of the vaccine plants of Merck to help increase the manufacturing capacity of j and uh, in doing the filling. And then the Biden is going to use the Defense Production Act to basically uh, uh, enable Merck to get the right equipment to upgrade their facility there. So the US is drastically increasing its capacity as a result of that. In addition that, to that, in Europe, uh, j and made a deal with Sanofi, which is a French company, to also uh, retrofit some of their production and bottling to be able to get to 12 million doses. So I would expect in the next several months, you're going to see a massive increase in capacity uh, thanks to this to, to this kind of really uh, coll amazing collaboration uh, between pharma uh, companies. Uh, I want to do a review of long COVID. And, and long COVID now is being called post-acute COVID syndrome, PACS. Um, and just as a reminder, between 10 to 30% of all infected people, regardless of age, and regardless of the severity of the symptoms when you got infected there, have long-term chronic conditions. And, 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 and you're going to see the data is stunning, because if you do the math, there has been 26 million confirmed cases in the U.S., multiply this by a factor of two to three X by the people that we're under reporting there. And then you do 10 to 30% incidents there and you're talking eight to 20 million people there who need help. And they're not getting it right now. It's gonna be one of the big things you're gonna hear in the next six months. Uh, what are the medical challenges? Uh, it's unbelievable. Uh, there's more than 98 symptoms. Everybody needs to have, you know, a personalized diagnostic and therapeutic because every case is slightly different. It requires multi-specialists, which we know the healthcare system in the U.S. is terrible at that. Uh, it's usually very good at one organ uh, being in trouble there. And the primary care providers are, are, are ignoring those patients there because they're not really equipped to do the diagnosis and, and they're not equipped to do the coordination of care. So a lot of these, these very frustrated patients, they are now self-organizing support group. And I'll, I'll mention some of those groups in case you know somebody who needs help. So there is a massive need to centralizing the data knowledge and developing algorithms to really help those patients there to navigate and get personalized treatment there. So the World Health Organization last week came up with how to prepare for long COVID. And it's a massive issue because a third of those patients that cannot go back to work, they're permanently disabled, they cannot go back to work. Who's going to pay for these people there? Is it the government? Is it the employers? You know, what are, what are all the political uh, uh, ramification of this? Uh, it, it is expected that 25% of people in their mind have symptoms after a month, 10% after 12 weeks. Uh, a lot of the complaint is extreme fatigue and chest and muscle pain, shortness of breath. They go up the flight of stairs and they're exhausted. And it's affecting multiple systems uh, across the body there. And uh, more women than men right now. Uh, uh, but, you know, we're still trying to understand how that works. And so it's a black hole right now because there is no diagnostic code. There's diagnostic code for congestive heart failures. There's diagnostic codes for diabetes, but there is none for long COVID. So the World Health Organization is recommending to create some new ICD-10 codes so we can at least keep track of it. So at least we know what the costs are and we can help these people get treated, diagnosed, and, and, and basically uh, identify what's the most effective therapy there. So uh, finally, uh, we're starting to have uh, some coordination on a worldwide basis to deal with this. Uh, the U.S. is going to put $1 billion in an NIH grant, but that's just studying. And this is some, to give you some idea of the magnitude of some of the papers that have been published there. So in the U.K., they show that 10% of symptoms after 12 weeks. Uh, they have shown that 52% uh, in another study there, people were hospitalized. Uh, you know, that they had uh, basically persistent fatigue after 10 weeks. You can see the number are uh, astonishing there. In Belgium and Holland, they're basically doing a group uh, of people who are uh, on a treat and outpatient basis there, and pretty much all of them have problems after three months. Uh, it is a significant problem there. Uh, I'll pick some of the other number there in Italy. Uh, most patients there had problems, uh, you know, 60 and 90 days. 
uh, the China has shown the 76% of abnormalities in the imagings. Uh, it, 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 you're going to see that's the iceberg of COVID. The true issue with COVID has never been the mortality of 0.5 to 1.5%, and, and people are arguing about it. It's the fact you have a 10 to 30% chance of permanent damage. Let me kind of walk you through some of the facts, just to, because I think you need to convince other people we are not out of the woods, we still need to be protective. So Dr. Fauci is estimating around 30% or at least 8 million Americans right now have been exposed and may be chronic. JAMA just came out with a new paper showing a study for up to nine months after the illness onsets. And you can see that 30% reported persistent symptoms as long as nine months was the big issue being hypertension, a heart uh, uh, difficulty uh, controlling blood pressure fatigue and loss of smells and folks. And to give an idea, this is the people with the symptoms in the gray color while they were acute. And this is in the yellow colors, people who have the symptoms you know, uh, nine months later there. So you can see there's a big percent of the population there that has this long-term problem. And, and what's the damage? It's across the body. It's like a train wreck. I mean, I, I have no way to explain that. It's cardiovascular, the heart, respiratory, the lungs, dermatology, a lot of problem on the skin, neurological, brain fog is a big, big problem there, and uh, memory impairment, psychiatric, a lot of these people have anxieties and depression. And then uh, there is an onset of diabetes. So let me kind of work for some of that. Uh, a study done on SARS, which is probably the one data set that we have that's the most accurate, oops, sorry about this, uh, is that uh, this is, the, two, the, this is the, 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 the cousin of COVID-19. Uh, this was in March, 2010. And what they showed is that 52% of the patients still has lung damage two years later. And they had uh, um, uh, basically airway diseases uh, and, and it's called ground class opacity. When you look at the X-ray, instead of being nice and dark, it's kind of all white. And the problem is that that means that these people 17 years later uh, still have those damage. These are permanent damage. Uh, I'll just show you some of the picture here. You have these people start with viral pneumonia in the hospital there, and they develop into this fibrosis, into this damage of the lungs there, which if it's really severe, could require a lung transplant. And so you can see that uh, a patient there who have COPD or have asthma are significantly higher risk of long-term damage. In addition to that, fibrosis, which is the ability of the body to pass oxygen, but also for the lungs to be elastic. It's like rigid. And so you can see some of these pictures of these patients there. I mean, it's horrific to look at this. Uh, if you look at the long-term heart damage, uh, if this is the normal fiber there of what's contracting the heart, and, and what happens after uh, they, they basically put the, the COVID-19 exposed to these muscle fibers, it's like Cuisinart, it's shrek to pieces, there's nothing left. And so uh, they did some autopsy uh, of people who died from COVID and they show on the MRI that 78% had permanent damage of those uh, muscle fibers in the heart. It's irreversible damage because the cells cannot regenerate themselves. Uh, and so, so that leads to heart failures, arrhythmias, and all those problems a lot of these patients are reporting, including young people there. So you can see that afterwards, it's like there's no DNA left. It's just like, as I said, it's like Cuisinart is the only way I can explain it. It's just shred to piece. Uh, if you look at the heart abnormality there, there was another data from Frankfurt showing that when they did imaging uh, and they look at the different risk factor there, that 78% show what's called myocardial inflammation uh, of those patients there. The thing that's a new one is that it triggers diabetes. It does damage the pancreas where you have people who were totally normal before. And then suddenly uh, they develop type one onset, not type two, you know, uh, it's type one, which means you stop making insulin. Uh, another one that came out recently is musculoskeletal manifestation. It triggers inflammatory arthritis. And you can see this pocket here of the damage there uh, in, the, in the patient's shoulder there. And so, and that's the big worry is that it's triggering autoimmune disorders. And in this case, it's the auto, auto, autoimmune myositis, rheumatoid arthritis there, and a whole bunch of other problems there like uh, in, uh, in like chronic fatigue syndromes. So what are the causes? Well, we don't fully know. Uh, what we think more and more is that there's clearly something due to the fact that you develop these blood clots and blood clots can create uh, pulmonary embolism or strokes. Uh, or MI and therefore they have long-term damage, but also damage to the capillaries all around the body. 
uh, you can trigger autoimmune response that you may have had a, a, a genomic a risk at, but never knew that it was a ticking bomb because there was no trigger. And now this is the trigger. We know for sure there's what's called dysautonomia, which is a damage to the autonomic nervous system. The autonomic nervous system is what basically keeps your body ticking when it, uh, and basically does a lot of the things like blood vessel constriction. So a lot of these people have problem controlling their temperature or their blood pressure or their heart rhythm there. Uh, and then, of course, a lot of people are complaining about losing the smell and taste because uh, the nerve has been damaged and it takes a while to recover. So uh, the good news is that Cedar Sinai, uh, Mount Sinai in New York was the first one a few months ago. And since now, we have 80 post-COVID rehab that have opened across the country. They all at different stages. Some of them do multiple organs, some only do lungs. Uh, so, but here's the list you can take a look at and I'll post it on, on uh, YouTube of where you can find something. But look at, look at this, maybe a third of the states that have a, a COVID clinic there and it, they, they cannot do the capacity of the patients there. There are some support group that have been self-organized. The survivor group um, has 100,000 members there. Uh, a third of the members were not able to go back to COVID uh, after they recover. Uh, you know, uh, there's a long haul COVID fighters. The, there's a long list of self-organized there. There's a very high frustration uh, across, across the group people were not being, being helped. Uh, recently, last week, uh, the Long COVID Alliance was launched where 50 of these groups got themselves organized to, uh, to basically work together. Uh, the NIH is now uh, going to basically invest $1 billion to do longitudinal study there. But in the meantime, we need to help and, and treat these patients there. So I'll post some of these links. So please stay positive, wear a mask, help the other friends around you to wear a mask, educate them, and please get vaccinated. Uh, stay healthy and hopefully I'll see you in two weeks.